So I've always loved the Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. I don't know if you guys know those books. Adams imagines that people build a great supercomputer called Deep Thought to answer the great questions of life, the universe, and everything. And Deep Thought calculates and calculates and calculates for 7.5 million years before finally declaring that it has the answer to the great questions of life, the universe, and everything. And the answer is 42. <laughs> so the people say, what? 42? After 7.5 million years, that's all you've got? And Deep Thought replies, I've checked the answer very carefully. It's definitely correct. I think the problem is that you never knew what the question was. Metaphysics is about the deepest questions of life, the universe, and everything. It's about the structure of reality and our place in the cosmos, how it all fits together. The story of metaphysics, at least in the Western tradition as we usually tell it, begins with the uh, Greek philosopher Thales, whose sole recorded pronouncement is, everything is water. Okay, we didn't get off to the best start there. But <laughs> soon after Thales, we get Plato, who starts worrying about the place of abstract objects like numbers and ideas. Where are they, these numbers? How do these numbers interact with the concrete world around us? And Plato goes on to, to posit the existence of this second realm, independent from the concrete realm of space and time that we inhabit, a realm that we now somewhat mockingly call platonic heaven in which all the numbers and the ideas are to be found, leading to the question of how could these uh, numbers and ideas, if they're off in platonic heaven, connect to the world around us? And so we have this debate that's continued now for about 2,500 years as to how numbers and water and persons and everything around us all fits together into a seamless, unified When a debate goes on for 2,500 years with no sign of resolution, inevitably, you get skeptics. People start wondering, what's this all about? Do these questions even have meaning? In 1948, the great American philosopher Willard Van Orman Quine, who taught at Harvard, published uh, an article on what there is that had a profound influence on metaphysical discussion. Quine had a conception of what metaphysical questions are about, and he also had a method for answering these questions. Quine said that metaphysical questions are about what there is. They're about what exists. So, for instance, for the question of numbers, Quine had it that the great metaphysical question is, do numbers exist? Of course, Quine pointed out that the question of, what, of what, what, what is there has a simple answer, everything. But he said there remains room for dispute over cases, and numbers was one of his primary examples. So Quine also, as I mentioned, has a method for trying to answer questions such as whether numbers exist. His method is look at our best theory of the world, and for Quine, that was science, and see whether our best theory of the world makes ineliminable reference to the entities in question. And the method has bite. Quine himself went from thinking that there are no such thing as numbers, went from thinking that numbers don't exist, to thinking that actually, no, numbers do exist. And he went to that conclusion from seeing the role that numbers seem to be playing in our best mathematical physics. So for Quine, the great questions of metaphysics, the deepest questions of life, the universe, and everything, are what is there? What exists? Quine was soon joined in a debate by the great German philosopher Rudolf Carnap, who in 1935, uh, he's a socialist and a pacifist, fled Nazi Germany for America, and was actually something of a teacher to Quine. Carnap agreed with Quine that metaphysical questions are about what exists, about what there is. But he disagreed with Quine as to whether metaphysical questions are ultimately meaningful. By Carnap's lights, 
you could choose to talk, say, numbers talk if you wanted to. And that was really a practical question, a question of convenience, a question of whether it just suits your needs to talk that kind of talk. And Carnap thought that if you do choose to talk numbers talk, then yeah, internal to that framework, internal to that way of talking, numbers exist. But if you want to ask the question of whether numbers exist external to any framework, out there independently of us, Carnap thought that that was an empty pseudo-question. So there was then this great debate between Quine and Carnap, and most contemporary metaphysics textbooks now begin with the great Quine-Carnap debate as the kind of precursor to metaphysical discussion. It's usually thought that Quine won the debate and rehabilitated traditional metaphysics, though there's a scattering of Carnapian dissidents in the community who still hold out for Carnap as winning the debate. I don't want to talk much about the Quine-Carnap debate here. Rather, I want to focus on flagging a shared assumption of both Quine and Carnap, which is that these metaphysical questions, these deep questions of life, the universe, and everything, are questions about what there is, questions about what exists, such as, are there numbers? There's something strange about that question. For if you think about it, I think it's very obvious that, yes, of course, there are numbers. For instance, there are numbers between 0 and 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, you see. And from the fact that there are some numbers between 0 and 9, it follows immediately, logically, that there are some numbers. From the fact that there are prime numbers, it follows that there are numbers we can get to the conclusion that there are numbers, that numbers exist in a very quick and superficial way. If those were the deep questions of metaphysics, something's gone wrong. Maybe, just like the people in Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we didn't know what the right questions were. It gets worse. Not only is the answer to the question of whether numbers exist superficial and seemingly trivial, the kind of thing that even kindergarten mathematics would prove. It's the kind of thing that requires no serious scientific work to establish. So we don't need to look to the details of modern mathematical physics to see the use of numbers there in order to establish that numbers exist. We just need to notice that there are even numbers. Moreover, none of our deep questions about where the numbers are, are they in platonic heaven or or, or what, and how numbers can connect with the concrete world around us have been answered just by pointing out that, that since there are numbers between 0 and 9, there are numbers. We seem to have missed something here. There's been a movement in the last decade or so uh, featuring people like Kit Fine, Fabrice Correa, Gideon Rosen, Karen Bennett, and myself to re-understanding the great questions of metaphysics, not as questions about what exists, but as questions about what grounds what. On this view, the deepest questions are about the fundamental structure of reality, what the basic building blocks of the world are, and how things are dependent upon them. Consider, for example, an H2O molecule. We now know that an H2O, that an H2O molecule has some constituent structure that its very name suggests. It's built up out of an H, another H, and an O. And so the H, the H, and the O, those atoms, are more fundamental than the molecule that's built up out of them. And on the conception of metaphysical structure that uh, uh, Fine, Correa, Rosen, Bennett, myself, and others advocate, what the great questions are about are about what are the fundamental building blocks of being, and how is the rest of it? How are molecules? and persons, and chairs, and tables, and everything else. How is everything else built up out of it? This conception of metaphysics, in some ways, isn't new, but traces back to Aristotle, who, alongside with Plato, is the great font of ideas in the Western tradition. Um, uh, uh, Whitehead once said that philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. And Aquinas, the great medieval philosopher, referred to Aristotle simply as the philosopher, as if there could be no other. So this is the heart of the tradition. For Aristotle, metaphysics is about being itself. 
And elsewhere, Aristotle says that metaphysics is the study of substances, which are the fundamental and independent units of being, and about what depends on these substances. So in place of asking whether numbers exist, as Quine thought the metaphysician should ask, Fine, myself, and the others who are following in Aristotle's old footsteps want to ask, are numbers fundamental? And if not, what do they depend on? Do they depend on the structure of the concrete world? Or do they depend, possibly even, on the structure of our own minds, on our thought and our language? So we have Plato, who thinks that numbers are fundamental and independent constituents of reality. Aristotle, who thinks that numbers are reflections of the concrete realm, and uh, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who thinks that numbers are in some sense reflections of our conceptual scheme. These views all agree that numbers exist. They disagree, though, about the deep question of whether numbers are fundamental. And if they're not fundamental, what they depend on, and in particular, whether they depend on us. So that was all pretty abstract, but you know, it's metaphysical, what do you expect? Let's talk about some applications of this way of thinking to some problems that I think should be uh, deeply interesting for all of us. One standing problem in, in metaphysics and also in neuroscience and cognitive science is the place of our mental lives, our conscious experience in nature. On the one hand, we have dualists who uh, go back at least to the great French philosopher René Descartes, who thinks that nature is fundamentally divided between a material realm in which we find our bodies and a spiritual mental realm in which we find our minds or our soul, and that these realms are in some uh, difficult to understand way connected, and that we ourselves as creatures are these divided creatures with, as it were, a, mater a, a material body and, uh, and, and a, a, a spiritual ghost out there harnessed to our body. On the other hand, we have materialists who think of there being just the one material realm and who think that consciousness is somehow a reflection of and dependent upon the workings of our brain and who think that we as creatures are more unified, material creatures, whose physical actions and our mental lives are ultimately grounded in how we are as material beings. Okay, I don't want to take a stand on that debate here. That's a whole other topic. I myself prefer the materialist view, but I'm not going to be able to go into that here. What I want to point out is just the way in which moving away from questions about what exists to questions or what, about what's fundamental helps us get to better questions about the nature of conscious experience. From the perspective of Quine, who wants to ask just what exists, it would seem that the only question about the mind and conscious experience is just, well, does it exist? To which the answer is, of course our minds exist. Of course our conscious experience exists. In fact, if there's, uh, we, we seem to have uh, uh, as strong, if not stronger, direct evidence for the existence of our own conscious experience in this moment than anything else. So of course these things exist. But the interesting question that divides the dualists from the materialists is whether mind and conscious experience is a fundamental ingredient of reality or whether it's dependent upon the material structure of the world. A second sort of question one that I've been preoccupied with, is the classic debate between monists and pluralists as to which is more fundamental, the cosmos as a whole or the little bitty parts. So the monists, in a tradition including great philosophers like Plotinus, Spinoza, and Hegel, held that reality most fundamentally is a vast, single, and interconnected whole. To the extent that the monists grant that individuals that are parts of the cosmos like you and I exist, the monists would say that we are to be understood as dependent fragments of the whole. The pluralists, on the other hand, and this is a tradition that includes great philosophers like uh, Aristotle, Leibniz, Bertrand Russell, hold that what's most fundamental are the little bits of being, maybe the little atoms. And they think that the cosmos as a whole is built up out of these little atoms, is something like just a heap made up of these little, of these little bits. 
And again, I don't want to take a side on this debate. I just want to point out how reconceiving this debate in terms of grounding structure helps us get a better sense of what's at issue. For if we look at this debate just in terms of what exists, then we wind up just asking, does the cosmos exist? Well, of course it does. Do the little parts of the cosmos, including you and I, exist? Well, of course we do. If that's the debate, it doesn't seem very interesting. But if we turn to a debate about what's more fundamental and what depends on what, what grounds what, we get something much more interesting in which there can be lively and interesting debate about the fundamental structure of reality. Should we think of our place in the cosmos as being, as it were, built up out of our little constituent bits? Or should we think of it as being carved out of the larger cosmos as a whole? So I want to conclude by reflecting on what this can mean for us, a kind of takeaway message. You know, this isn't going to help get you rich. It's not going to help get you into Harvard. It's not going to help with any of that stuff. But it maybe will help us give us a sense of understanding and a sense of meaning, because that's something that's vital to all of us as well. We don't live by bread alone. So I want to uh, speak about one thing that I think that the monist hypothesis of the whole world as a fundamental interconnected unity can bring to us. It's such a profound perspective on the world that I think we should hope that it's true. For if it's right, if we are all interconnected, if we are all nodes in the cosmic spider web, then we are not these kind of separated cells in a way that I think our culture tends to have us think. Rather, by our very nature, we are interwoven with each other and with all of the rest of nature. Perhaps this is an attitude that can help us learn, that can help, help us understand how better to care for and to cherish the people around us and all of nature that surrounds us. Thank you.